Okay, so here with me I have an Arduino and I've connected 5 volts of ground to both power rails on the breadboard. What we're going to be trying to do today is emulate the behavior of a missile launch. The way a missile launch works is two people have to turn a key at the same time and hold it for a certain amount of time. If both those conditions are true, then the mission, the, sorry, the missile will be launched successfully. Let me let Chuck Penson explain. Then this is a legitimate order to go. That gives us permission to put in our launch keys. I've already put them in for us. Key right here for you, Commander. And for me, there's a key way over here. Keys are far enough apart that not even a long-arm guy like me can reach them both. Keys must be turned within two seconds of each other and held, or spring-loaded, so held for five seconds to start the launch. That guarantees that two people will be required to do it. You just can't run back and forth and do it yourself. This is the same thing I'm trying to accomplish, but instead of a two second delay between the two keys being turned, it will be an only 0 0.5 second delay, making it even harder. Since we don't have keys in Arduino, we can be using push buttons instead. However, due to the limitations of Tinkercad, I cannot press two push buttons at the same time. Of course, they can be easily done in real life with two fingers, but I can only click in one spot in, on the simulation on my computer. So instead, I'll be using slide switches. Slide switches enable me to keep something held down and then move over to the next slide switch and turn that off, effectively simulating me holding it down, holding them both down at the same time. Since I'm going to have to go to one and the other, and I can't click that fast, I'll give myself a lenient 0 0.5 seconds um, delay between when both of them must be pressed. If they're pressed, in, if one is turned on and then um, five seconds later, another one's turned on, for example, it won't initiate the sequence. And this is because it's meant to need two people to do it. Um, and of course, the number can be dropped even further in real life. And these, and just so you know, these buttons will be placed um, very far from each other so that not one person can press them at the same time. Okay, so let's now look at how a slide switch works. A slide switch is when, in one configuration, bridges the um, electrically connects terminal, terminal 1 and common. and in the other state, when it's flipped over this way, it electrically connects common and terminal 2. This is simply done through the use of a switching metal um, sort of pipe or not, or any metal conductive um, surface that just gets physically manipulated by the human or person using it um, left and right to connect or and disconnect from these terminals. So what we want to do is we want to read whether we're which state the switch is in, if it's this way or if it was the other way. We can do this by having a connected um, by having a connected ground and having a connected 5 volts, and then reading that signal. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So, if we power one terminal with 5 volts, and we make that red, and the other one with the ground. Now, we're able to, sorry, that would be black. Now, we can go ahead and get a reading from here. If we go and connect to one of our digital pins, let's say pin number 12, if the uh, the switch, the slide switch, is on in this configuration, it'll be connected to ground. The, you'll get no reading because this pin will be connected to ground, and that's a zero volt or a low signal. However, if the simulation was turned on and you switch the other way, now this pin will be correct, connected to five volts because that's um, now the two terminals that are connected, and it'll read a high signal. We can test this out if we launch our code. And switch over to text since that gives us more control. Uh, getting rid of this blink code and switching this from an output to an input, we then also need to begin the serial. The serial is usually begun on port 9600 because that is a port that is usually available in the system. Next, all we need to do is serial print ln, sorry, serial.print, and this is going to make a new line output to the terminal, um, to the serial monitor each time. And we want to say digital read, and we're going to be reading from pin 12. And you'd want to use a variable, but just for right now, for testing, it's OK. And I'm missing one bracket here, even though I didn't get an error because I don't think we click properly. Um, but there we go. So we're getting 0, 0, 0, and then I switch it over, and we're getting 1s. OK, so that's how we know. So we know that our switch is reading input correctly. Um, so now let me go ahead and wire up the other switch. Okay, so here are two switches. The first switch is represented by orange because it has the orange connection to our, our um, input pin, 
and the second switch is represented by blue for the same reason. Now we can go ahead and test the second pin by checking for pin 11 just to make sure that we've wired up everything correctly. Always a good practice to make sure that the circuit is working and that way you'll know it's not a problem with your code um, but rather a problem with your circuit. So in this case both our code and circuit are working correctly. Now we can get started to incorporate the other um, other parts of our circuit which would be the five LEDs and for, to signify them so what's gonna so the way we're gonna emulate a missile launch is we're gonna have one LED that turns on when the missile is going to be launched and five LEDs that are sort of gonna build up for each of the five seconds that you have to hold both the switches for. So kind of like a power up and then the final LED will turn on signifying the missile has been launched. So I'm gonna go ahead and wire those five LEDs um rather six LEDs up right now. And let's not forget to add our resistors. I want you to do something different for this project. Something that I hoped would help you understand the code I write easier. And would save a lot of time. The strategy involved writing the code beforehand and testing all the small bugs first. Then I would later explain the code to you line by line. The advantage of doing this is we don't have to spend time working out silly bugs such as missing semicolons or not declaring variables. This way, I can spend more time focusing on what matters, and that's the conceptual understanding of the code. I hope this new format is easier for you to understand and saves you some time. Before we get into the code, I thought it'd be helpful for you to see the the actual effect of the circuit. That way, when you're looking at the code, you'll be able to look back in your mind and see what relates to what. So let's get started. If we start the simulation, you can see that nothing happens yet. That's because none of the switches have been turned on. Again, remember these switches as being constantly pressed down instead of being a one-time toggle. This would be more realistic to a push button. Unfortunately, as mentioned before, I can't click both at the same time, and hence why I need to keep a permanent state switch. Okay, so if I turn one on, and then I wait a certain amount of time, and a quite, sorry, a quite significant amount of time, uh, or really anything greater than 0.5 seconds, and then turn the other one on, the, the LEDs will not start lighting up. However, if we turn them off again, and then I turn one on, and then quickly turn the other one on, you'll see that our first LED turns on. Now, within one second, the next LED will turn off. The thing to notice, however, is the simulation time up here. This simulation time is, you can see at, at, as how fast the how fast Tinkercad is processing requests. Compared to real life, this is much slower than normal. And something is funky is going on with the time in Tinkercad. This is running really slowly. You can see this, um, and it's no fault of the code or Arduino, but mostly, most likely a Tinkercad problem. This is why it takes so long. However, we are on the final LED now. And in one second approximately, this final LED will turn on, and then there's no going back. Then the entire system goes and the red LED starts flashing. At this point, the nuclear missile has been launched, and there's no turning back from this point. However, before this point, if either of the switches are turned off once the sequence has been initialized, then the sequence will have been broken. Observe. We can wait till it gets to one more LED, so you can see them both turning off. Just give it a second here. And now if we turn a single switch off, you'll see that they slowly fade away. And that's because the entire system has turned off, in fact. Since one of them broke. This broke the entire connection and stopped the launch of the nuclear missile. So that's, the, that's the properties of the circuit. Now let's go look at the code. OK, so here's the code. We can go through each of these variables explaining what they do. The first variable, the current time, says exactly what it does. It stores the current time in milliseconds of, of how long the program has been running. AVAL current and AVAL pass, as well as the corresponding BVALs. They represent the state of the, the switch is in. The past is exactly one loop cycle behind than the current. 
This allows me to check whether the state has switched on the switch, meaning if it has gone from an on to an off position or from an off to an on position. It's used to detect just a state change. Besides that, the pass variable is not used. A and B time are each used to check when the button was pressed, when each corresponding button was pressed. This is so we can subtract them and see whether they were pressed within 0 0.5 seconds of each other, or 500 milliseconds. This variable simply suggests that, exactly what it's named, um, it, it asks the question of whether the countdown timer has started and it was used by other um, conditional statements to execute their code. This stores the actual value of the countdown timer, and um, this, unlike its name, does not count down, but it counts up, starting from zero, going all the way to 5,000, and that's when the nuke or the missile would launch. Um, so that name is a bit dis um, disingenuous, uh, but it's a helpful thing for the countdown timer, because often in television or media, you'd see it, you see them count down, but it was just easier to implement it in a count up system, and count up just doesn't have the same ring to it. Next is start time. Um, this signifies the time that we've checked uh, when the two switches have been pressed in 0 0.5 milliseconds. So when the second switch is pressed, or you can think of it as when the greater when the greater time between the two switches, we choose that time. And then that's the time when the countdown timer starts. And it's important to get um, in the method because of the method of how we get the actual countdown time. And finally, you have a variable called launched. And what that does, it, that it just, again, asks the question, has the missile or nuke been launched? Um, and there's basically two states of the program. One state where it's always trying to achieve this launched state and one state where it has achieved it and it can never go back. So let's go into the setup. So. In setup, we have this loop here. What this loop does is it uh, declares all the LEDs as outputs and adds them to this power up LEDs list. And we have to use an extra variable here since we're going backwards in terms of what we're adding to the list, but want to go forwards in terms of the list. Why is that? It's because the first LED that we want to turn on, assuming we're going from left to right, which we are, is connected to pin number seven. And it decrements down from 7 to 6 to 5 to 4 to 3 to 2. However, we want 7 to be in the place of 0 in the list because that's the first index and that's the first LED we want to turn on. And that's what this loop is doing. It's setting J, which starts at 0, as you can see over here, and it's setting that to I, which starts at 7. Now J goes up as it's incrementing and I goes down. This effectively reverses the order and increments them all uh, into the corresponding positions in the list. Also important is we're declaring all these pins as output pins. Next we declare our two buttons as inputs, fairly simple, and begin the serial monitor at the specified port, which is always going to be on 600. Now we can see our diversion in our program. We have our if launched statement, where we have a very small portion of code, where an, in this code there is no statement that says launch equals false, which means once it enters this code it can never escape unless of course the program is turned off. Now, what happens is more interesting, and we can cover it really quickly, this is the blinking behavior you see. This is a simple blink code, and it's a behavior you see once a missile is launched, you can see the red LED flickering. And that's just turning on and off, and having a 200 millisecond delay between each. But that's probably the most boring part. What's the most interesting is over here in this else, um, this very long else, and this entire part of code is just trying to get to this. This small part of code, okay, um, but it's it's making sure that it's doing it in the correct way and according to the parameters we had set out before, uh, with the whole within 0 0.5 seconds and then if you hold it for five seconds and all that stuff, okay. So right here we can see that the values are being updated. So the past is being set to the current, which means it's one cycle behind, and the current is getting its new value from the actual button. So with that, hopefully, uh, if you just think about it for a little bit of time, it should be clear how the past is one cycle behind the current. Um, and here we go, here's what we're checking. So, here we're for, and by the way, this is done for A and B values, okay? Um, and we're checking, the first one is A, and it's just checking if the current is not equal to the past. If the current is not equal to the past, that means that there must have been a switch. Something changed, right? If, if they're not the same. If they're the same, then nothing has changed. And you can even see you have a comment here saying button switched. Uh, and, we're, and we're also printing serial monitor. So, what we want to say now is if, so we've switched it, but what have we switched it to? If we've switched it to one, 
then record the time, and that's stored in A time, if you remember, and we use this function called mills, which gets how many milliseconds the program has um, uh, progressed in. And this is being a little glitchy in um, Tinkercad. It's moving a bit slow. Um, but yeah, that's what it's going to do. And then we also print the time um, to the serial monitor. Uh, this was mostly for debugging purposes and use not using the final um, final product, although it could be. Um, and then if it's not one, so if uh, this is not one, if it's zero, because this is either going to be one or zero, that's how the digital read works. Um, so if it's being turned from on to off, you know that you have just broken, um, you've just broken the cycle, or if the cycle hasn't started, um, you at least have to reset it. So that's what we're doing here. We're just resetting everything corresponding um, to that button. So first of all, we're so if if the if the if we already had started the countdown, um, we would set that to false, and we would set the countdown time. We set it back to zero. If we hadn't already started it, it doesn't matter since these are the default parameters and no harm done. Also, an important thing to do is reset the a time to zero because again, if we had started. Um, the countdown that would have been set by a function that you'll see coming up um, a, a bit later. Uh, rather, not not bit later. The function is right above. So it would have been set right here. And we do the exact same thing for B. Okay, so this is the exact same thing. There's no point of going over it since it's literally this code um, where everywhere you see A is being B. So that's the same thing done for both buttons. Okay, so moving past that code, we get to this. Um, it's a long bit of code, uh, but it's fairly easy to understand. So Let's break it down piece by piece. The first thing we're doing here is we're taking the absolute difference between the time the first button was pressed, button A was pressed, and button B was pressed. Absolute, by the way, means it's getting rid of a negative sign if it exists and only getting the number. Because say we press button um, B first and then button A. Sorry, other way around. If we press button A first and then button B, button B would be bigger and button A would be smaller. And we'd get a negative number. And that might not be what we want. And it might go out of our range and break our code so we just want the raw difference in a positive value and that's what abs does for us okay so we get that raw difference and we just check if it's less than 500 and remember this is this this times are in milliseconds so 500 means 0 0.5 seconds which is 500 milliseconds now that signifies that there's two keys returned on um within 500 milliseconds off each other but we also want to check that both of them are in fact actually um, are on at this time because say, for example, um, B time is never defined since the second switch is not turned on. And somehow with superhuman speed, as soon as the system turned on, you switched key A on. Um, so let's say you got a time of 300 milliseconds for A time. Okay, so that would be 300 minus 0. And that would be less than 500. And then would, that would activate. But we don't want this to activate unless both of, the been, have the, both of them have been turned on within 500 milliseconds of each other. And the last thing we want to check is that we haven't already started the countdown because this this conditional statement is to start the countdown. Notice how we get countdown start here. Now, in fact, if this was the only command in here, it would not be a big deal to keep repeating this to be true. Um, although it would conflict with other things such as turning the LED off. Uh, but that's best. Um, but another thing that's definitely going to affect it is you constantly, if you don't check that the countdown has not already been started, and you're constantly doing that in. The countdown you're constantly going to be changing the start time and incrementing it to the current time which means you're going to think that there's no time difference between where you are now and where you started so your countdown time will never increase above one and remember it's the tricky part where it's increasing and in, despite it being called countdown time okay so that's all we're, we're checking a couple of those conditions that first condition we're checking uh, is over here that the buttons have been pressed within 500 milliseconds Oops. The buttons have been pressed within 500 milliseconds of each other. That both ones are, in fact, have been pressed, or in this case, the slide switch, so being slid. And the final parameter is that we have not already started the countdown. If all those things are true, we will start the countdown and get the current time. And that's when the countdown starts. Okay, so here we can see that if the countdown has started, um, then what we're going to do to get the current countdown time is we're going to get the current time and subtract it from the start time. And remember, this is why it was important that the start time couldn't keep changing to the current time, because otherwise this would um, exactly equal zero if this kept updating. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and countdown time is going to keep increasing since mills, which gives the current time, is going to increase since the time the program has been running is going to increase. And this, but because 
this t start time is going to stay stagnant based on when the time it first started. Remember, and that's because we don't keep looping. Okay, so now we have our countdown time increasing from since when the two buttons have been detected. So let's just recap what we've done so far. We've, det we've detected this switch of a button. We've checked within whether it was a valid um, two turnings, two pressings, so that means within 500 milliseconds of each other. And we've started our countdown timer. Okay, moving on from here, we have a for loop. What this for loop aims to do is go through each LED and check whether it meets um, it meets the condition to turn on. Now you could have done this with six or five different if statements, but this is a much cleaner and more efficient way to do it. What we do is we go from i to so from zero to six, um, that those being the, i representing the indexes in our list of LEDs. So that would be from the LED on the left being at zero, and the LED on the right most being um, six. Okay, so and what we're gonna do actually, so there is a, is a small bug here, and although it wouldn't affect the actual program flow, um, since you're updating a value that doesn't exist and we're never gonna interact with, because that LED does not exist, um, we do want to change this to five, because if you remember, a uh, list is in fact zero based, which means even though it has six values, it only has five indexes, since it starts at zero and not one. Okay, so although it wasn't a bug that currently affects the code, if any future changes are made, we could find ourselves struggling to understand why that happened. All right, so now we can say if countdown time is greater than i times 1000. And all this times 1000 is doing is converting i, which is in seconds, to milliseconds. Okay, so, and remember, i goes from 0 um, to in 5. So that's from 0 to 5000. Okay. And countdown time also goes from zero um, to five thousand before the system finally goes back into that uh, goes into the final mode where it's not it's no longer going to run this code but run that um, code we saw above, which is the launch code. And we'll show how we switch that state um, very shortly. Um, so hopefully this makes sense. We can run through it if it does not. So we started i zero zero is not greater than so sorry. So let's say countdown time is zero because it just started um zero times 1000 if this is the first iteration of the loop so zero is not greater than zero so the first lead doesn't turn on the next millisecond however countdown time will be one and assuming we're still in the first iteration this will still be zero how now one is greater than zero so this will be true and will turn on led one if it's not true it makes sure that that led is turned off Hopefully, you can apply this to all the different LEDs and the different um, milliseconds that countdown time is in. And just as another example, um, say we're on the second state, so I would be 1. 1 times 1,000 is 1,000. And again, if countdown time has reached 1,000, or rather in this case, because it's a greater than, not greater than, equal to, if it's um, gone above 1,000, so let's say 1,001, then that LED will turn on and stay on um, until until the program is turned off. Um, and then, so that's uh, that's the loop that turns all those LEDs on based on how, how long the countdown timer has gone on for. And here's the final thing. So we just check if countdown time is greater than 5,000. And that's the end thing. And we turn our launch variable true. And at this point, all this code that we have, that we looked at over here, it's all um, not gonna be used anymore because this has been true. And the next time it goes around this loop, this condition will be true, it'll enter this code, and it's never going to leave, because there is no part in this code that makes this variable false. And what does this code do? As we reviewed in the beginning, it just blinks that red LED on and off. So that's the entire code. Um, that's how it all works. Hopefully you found this more um, educational or more uh, impactful than me writing the code, uh, with the, able to explain to you something that already exists, and hopefully you understood that better. Um, but that's it. We can go to the circuit if that helps you. Um, under angle let's go ahead and close this magnifier now. Um, so if you're just looking back at this code, um, seeing it visually, hopefully, um, with this code on the side, hopefully linking those ideas back to what the circuit is doing. Um, I can just point some things out for you. Like this is LED. Uh, this is switch A, switch B. This is the first LED at pin seven um, at index zero in the list, and this is the last one at pin two and index five in the list. Um, and yeah, and so hopefully those things are coming together for you, um, and hope you learned something, and until